Jean-Ignace Isidore Gerard was born in the northeastern French city of Nancy in 1803, but his family and friends called him Adolf after his older brother who had died in childhood. As an adult, he used the professional pseudonym Jean-Jacques Granville, and sometimes just Granville, a name he took from his grandparents' stage name when they had worked in cabaret in the city. He started drawing in childhood and was taught and encouraged by his father, who was a painter of miniatures. I can find no record of him attending art school, although that doesn't necessarily mean he didn't. But in 1825, at the age of 21, he moved to Paris and began working as an illustrator. At the age of 24, he was working and studying under the supervision of the artist André Léon Larue. And although it was Larue who took the credit for the design of a pack of hand-coloured playing cards titled La Sibylle des Salons, it was Granville who had created them. But the work which first established him as a significant figure in French illustration was the series Les Métamorphoses du Jour, published between 1828 and 1829. This collection of lithographs comprised over 70 images featuring characters with human bodies but animal heads, each of which satirised various less than desirable aspects of human behaviour and personality traits. Although strictly speaking no more anthropomorphised than Egyptian animal-headed gods, the facial characteristics of each animal were exaggerated in order to express human character and emotion. And the popular success of this series greatly enhanced his reputation for creating comical and occasionally unsettling imagery. He followed this with Voyage pour l'Eternité in 1829, and this darkly comic series portraying the omnipresence of death was another which demonstrated his facility for lithographic work. Like many of Granville's creations, some editions were published in colour, applied by teams of female colourists working to the illustrator's written instructions. Naturally enough, this increased their commercial value considerably. The success of these volumes led rapidly to him becoming a regular contributor of satirical illustrations to Paris's most respected and popular humorous publications, including La Caricature and Le Charivari, and the image he created for them further enhanced his reputation for visually unsettling work. La Carte Vivante du Restaurateur was a series of 12 satirical lithographs which was published sequentially between 1831 and 1832 in La Caricature. And also in 1832 he produced a collection titled saint Jure Morale Politique which used monkeys to reflect human characteristics. Along with many of his contemporaries, Gromville used his talents to caricature and openly make fun of those in authority, including the King Louis Philippe, whose resemblance to a pair became an immensely popular meme of the period, which appeared regularly in magazines. But the King was far from amused and made all such disrespectful portrayals punishable with heavy fines and even imprisonment. La Caricature closed down completely and Le Charivari only survived by turning to broader social satire. In 1833, Granville had married his cousin, Margarita Henrietta Fischer, and moved into a new Parisian apartment. Their first son, Ferdinand, was born in 1834. And with family responsibilities, Granville quickly backed away from more contentious and dangerous work in favour of the illustration of novels and his own less politically overt material. In 1837, he illustrated Le Livre des Enfants, a rewrite of Perrault's fairy tales. And although the book contained about 30 spot illustrations by Granville, the various wood engravers were credited, but he was not. And in the same year, he produced about a hundred more for a collection of the songs composed by the highly popular songwriter and poet Pierre Jean de Béranger. This project gave him much greater opportunities to create some amusing social satires inspired by the lyrics. And this time, Granville was conspicuously credited on the cover and title pages. In 1838, Granville's edition of the Fable de la Fontaine was published and was an instant major success. This was a verse retelling of Aesop's fables, originally written in 1668, and several others have previously illustrated the work with varying degrees of success. Granville's visualisation exhibited a truly revolutionary visual quality not seen previously, 
which skillfully incorporated a range of varied anthropomorphic techniques in his more than 250 drawings, which were once again reproduced as wood engraving. In some cases he reverted to the animal head on a human body technique he'd used earlier on the Metamorphosis series, but there were others that were far more subtle and created plausible animal anatomy that was seemingly capable of human behaviour and movement. And in other cases he depicted the animals as they really were but gave them subtle humanised expressions. In the same year he also published a version of Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels which although workmanlike couldn't begin to compete with the evident labour of love the La Fontaine images had been. Granville's wife gave birth to a second son Henri in 1838 but in the same year tragedy struck the family when their first son Ferdinand died of meningitis. In 1840 his illustrated edition of Daniel Defoe's Robinson Crusoe was published along the same lines as his visualisation of Gulliver with a large number of mostly vignetted but a few full-page monochrome engravings. A year later when Henrietta was pregnant with their third child, young Henri also died at the age of three. And although not long after she gave birth to yet another son, George, tragedy struck again when his wife, never the most robust young woman, died during childbirth. And the grieving 37-year-old Granville was now bringing up his only surviving child as a widower, although he was by now wealthy enough to employ a nanny. The book Saint de la Vie Privée et Public des Animaux, a parody of an 1830 work by Balzac, was published in 1842. This book was Granville's own idea and the publisher engaged the services of a number of prominent French writers to create the text which he would illustrate and illuminate. He produced over 300 pen and ink drawings which were remarkably sensitively engraved. Like his Aesop's fables, this book also played to both his anthropomorphic and surreal imaginative strengths. Each of these images was compelling and visually articulate, and the book was undoubtedly one of his most significant achievements. In the same year, he also published his illustrated edition of Les Fables de Florian, written a century earlier a lesser-known collection of stories with just short of a hundred more illustrations of remarkable quality. In 1843 he collaborated with the writer Paul Emile Doran Fogg, who worked under the pseudonym Old Nick, to create the book Petite Misère de la Vie Humaine. This highly comical satire of humanity's various failings contained more than 200 illustrations, which enhanced and illuminated the text with considerable comic effect. In the same year he married again to Catherine Marceline Houlier and she gave birth to a son Armand in 1845. It's hard to imagine why but 1844's Un Autre Monde was actually one of his least successful projects in his lifetime. But the quality and peculiar nature of the images he created for this book subsequently came to be seen as seminal examples of what would later be called surrealism and critically acclaimed as such by quite a few of its 20th century exponents. The book takes place in a parallel world and its spectacularly absurd narrative unfolds primarily through the images, more like an early fantasy graphic novel than a conventional piece of written fiction. It had originally been Granville's ambition to both write and illustrate the book, but although he had contributed some short journalistic pieces to various magazines and newspapers, he wasn't comfortable with fiction and handed the writing over to Taxil de Lord, the editor of the journal Le Charivari. Granville's drawings, 36 full-page hand-coloured wood engravings and 146 monochrome vignettes are an overwhelming triumph of the absurd, which somehow managed to make a sort of logical sense in visual terms. The various connections of meaning and visual similarity make every image as compelling as the one before. And at least since his death this book has come to be considered his greatest creative achievement and it's easy to see why. In 1845 he collaborated again with the writer known as Old Nick and others on the book Sans Proverbe. This was a series of visual humorous interpretations of well-known French proverbs and Granville's images were telling social satires, even if by his own standards, less fanciful than other successes. 
In the same year his wife gave birth to a fourth son, they named Armand, and Granville was overjoyed at the addition to his family. In 1846, the satirical book Jérôme Pachiro à la Recherche d'une position sociale, written by Louis Raybaud, was published, and it contained a large number of highly imaginative and well-composed engravings of Granville's illustrations. One of the more distinctive aspects of these images was the widely different approaches to human anatomy within the same piece, from the broadly exaggerated through to anatomically correct. In 1847, he published Les Fleurs Animées, a series of personified flower illustrations printed as steel engravings far more subtle than wood and coloured by hand. And this book was certainly among his most popular during his lifetime. And in the same year, he produced what would be his last published work, titled Les Etoiles. In this volume, he created humanised visualisations of heavenly bodies as a series of imaginative female figures. Like his flowery illustrations, this series demonstrated the enduring power of his visual imagination, although both these projects were by his own standards quite restrained, and his usual satirical edge was nowhere to be seen. And although the popularity of his illustrations had never been greater, it was later in that year, with a final tragic blow, Granville's world unravelled completely, when George, the third son from his first marriage, died at the age of four. Granville is quoted as observing, death has only taken time out to sharpen his scythe. He'd become progressively disturbed by the apparently endless misery inflicted on him and his family, and the death of George was understandably just too much to bear. Soon after, he suffered a serious violent psychotic episode, and was admitted to a clinic in the town of Vannes. While there he died, apparently from the disease diphtheria, at the age of only 43. In the year following his death, Gromville's illustrated edition of Cervantes' Don Quixote was published, and in later years a large amount of the work he had created during his lifetime was reprinted and continued to be popular in France. In 1853, more than a thousand of his drawings were put up for sale by his family, and many can now be found in several museums. And although his terrible misfortunes and his own subsequent early death can't and shouldn't be ignored, I hope that ultimately it's the quality of his work and remarkably imaginative spirit for which he will continue to be most remembered. <laughs>